Hello all, how's it going? Uh, it's, it's Rezzy Orenji here with another Rezzy Reviews stream. Uh, today we are, once again, uh, tier ranking a band's discography. Last time we talked about King Crimson, we talked about their storied 50 year career as a band, their uh, reinvention in many different sounds. If you haven't checked out that stream, I would recommend it. it I really love King Crimson and I think uh, I, th I think they have a really cool discography, so check them out. Um, <laughs> but we're not here today to talk about King Crimson. Uh, we are here to talk about King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. They are... <laughs> Oh, I, I'm really excited for this episode, guys. They are probably one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, when I discovered them, uh, it's really exciting, too, because they are still, like, pretty much active in the prime of their artistic career as a band. I don't know. Um, I haven't been... I don't know. I haven't been this in tune with a modern band since... Uh, I don't know, since before I discovered them. I, I really feel some sort of kinship with these guys. Um, but, uh, how to say, um, just to clarify before we get into things, um, this is just taking a look at the band's studio albums. Uh, one of the things you'll be, uh, you can kind of tell right now looking at, uh, looking at what we got here, it's just, so many freaking albums to get through today. 18 studio albums. Um, and they're only like 11 years old, so that, that's freaking wild. Um, they have 18 studio albums, but they also have uh, a, a few EPs, a, a bunch of live recordings, uh, I think even a few like live films, and a bunch of like bootleg behind the scenes footage on YouTube, which I'm going to be referencing a bunch uh, during in the course of the stream. Um, but no, I am, I'm sticking just to the studio albums. I will probably mention the other material. So if you're interested, I would definitely recommend looking into it on your own. But for right now, uh, I guess let's just get into it. Um, who, before we start, uh, the tiering, uh, proper, who are King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard? Uh, well, they originally, um, not originally. They are a psychedelic rock band from Melbourne, Australia, founded in 2010. Uh, originally, they were a septet consisting of Joey Walker, Cook Craig, and Stu McKenzie on guitar, uh, though Stu plays a lot of other instruments, as we'll get into later, uh, Lucas Skinner on bass, Ambrose Kenny Smith on harmonica, Michael Cavanaugh, who I'll be referring to here in as Cavs, on drums, and Eric Moore on percussion and theremin, with vocals shared between Stu, Joey, Cook, and Ambrose. Technically, if you count their frequent art collaborator Jason Galea, who's made all of their album covers, like their live visuals, and most of the music videos, which, I mean, hey, if Peter Sinfield can be a member of King Crimson for being their words and lights guy, why the fuck not? This collective at its peak would consist of eight people. That's a lot of Aussie lads gathered in one space getting creative. So, what sort of art did these guys get up to? Well, in their very earliest days, King Gizzard, King Gizzard was a garage rock band in its purest form. They were just a bunch of lads from high school, a bunch of friends, who got together to jam and make loud music. They put out a few singles and EPs in their early form which showcased an energetic, if not that innovative, garage rock septet from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, while outside the scope of this video, I would recommend anyone who's a garage rock junkie to check this early stuff out, especially Willoughby's Beach, that's a rush of an EP. Uh, during this time, drummer Eric Moore would found the indie label Flightless Records in order to give Gizzard uh, King gives her their own platform to release music, and from there, uh, they sort of started their invasion of the rest of the world, so to speak. Uh, the debut al their debut album, which they released on Flightless, uh, 12 Bar Bruce, is 
in many respects a culmination of these early efforts into a concise near 35 minutes of loud, distorted, and above all fun rock music. It's driven by this powerful, straightforward rhythm section. Hold on a second. Just gonna take a sip of water here. Ah. Yeah, it's uh, really, uh, a really energetic garage rock music, essentially. Um, you've got tracks like Elbow, Muckraker, Uh-Oh, I Call Mom, Garage Linear, and Footy Footy, uh, which are these short bursts of garage energy which sometimes verge on the absurdly juvenile. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, it's just sometimes pretty funny, you know. Uh, whenever I listen to Footy Footy, I'm reminded, if, if you know uh, Rick and Morty's Bush World Adventures, uh, I'm reminded of that scene with, I, I think it's like the uncle of the giant whatever watching football on the television and being like, come on, kick the bloody ball, and I'm just, uh, I don't know. It's funny to my uh, soccer-tinged American, uh, cat American brain. Um, but other tracks on the album, they hint at a more experimental side of the band. A lot of the tracks feature pretty heavy guitar feedback, which, spoiler alert, would become a trademark of the Gizzard sound in the years to come. Uh, the track 9, which is a pretty great headbanging song in its own right, has a psychedelic outro which hinted at the sonic territories that the gang was looking to explore. The title track was recorded using entirely iPhones and well, it's all right. It's impressive for a song recorded on iPhones, but it's kind of a bit lumbering for my tastes. Uh, then you have the out of left field track, Sam Cherry's Last Shot, which is a full-on spaghetti western soundtrack, fe uh, featuring a narration over the by Ambrose's father, Broderick Smith, who himself is actually kind of a legend in the Australian uh, music scene. Not Australian music scene. In Australian music. Um, uh, this album, it, it also actually has a bunch of heavy, uh, sorry, I should also highlight, uh, just to know which album I'm talking about here, this one, the one with the uh, green lizard here on the front. Um, this album, it, 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 though, it does have a, it's, it's got a pretty heavy blues influence, uh, you know, Ambrose, of course, is the band's dedicated harmonica player, and he's a damn good player. I don't claim to know enough about harmonica to say, like, whether or not he's, like, one of the best. Uh, but he and his precious nasally voice, his, his nasally singing voice, shine on his own boogie-style track, Cutthroat Boogie. Uh, his appearances on other tracks on the album also lend them a bit of bluesy weight. You know, I think this is especially effective on tracks like Garage Lydiard and Sea of Trees. The uh, latter song is kind of a heavy song, actually, about feeling like shit to the point of contemplating suicide. Uh, so the harmonica sort of lends to the song's energetic melancholy? I, I don't know, I guess that's a word for it. A lot of tracks on this album are great fun, but some, like High Hope Slow and Bloody Ripper, I'm not that particularly impressed by. Uh, High Hope Slow is just kind of a forgettable track, and Bloody Ripper is so plodding and tame compared to the rest of the album. They're decent songs, but even at this early stage in their career, the band was capable of so much more. Overall, I think 12 Art Blue Bruise is a great debut, but with the benefit of hindsight, we know now just how much this band is capable of, so it kind of spoils some of this album in retrospect. It's kind of the same situation as Radiohead's debut album, you know, Pablo Honey. Not a bad album in its own right, and a good listen but they feel like an entirely different band with all the work that has come since where it can't help but come off as slightly premature. Uh, do listen to this, but keep in mind it's only a fraction of what this band was capable of. This is only the tip of the iceberg. I'm gonna give the, I'm gonna give 12 Bar Brews a B, or put it in the B category, rather. Uh, so here's a question. How do you follow up a string of garage rock releases, including your debut album, which hints at more experimental directions, which seem to be getting the entire country of Australia excited, and maybe even a few people from the far-off lands of Europe and America? Why? You take the most experimental moments of that album and crank them the fuck up to 11. We're going back to the Wild West, y'all! Yeah! 
Okay, so, um, <laughs> the frontman Stu McKenzie, he really did dig the sort of spaghetti western sound that you hear on uh, Sam Cherry's last, last shot on 12 Bar Brews. Uh, he's a gamer, like me, so he was big into stuff like the Red, Red Dead Redemption series, and I guess, along with the other boys, uh, they decided they'd challenge themselves and make their follow-up album a full-on spaghetti western audiobook in the vein of Ennio Morricone. Uh, its name is Eyes Like the Sky, uh, and it is... Let me... Hold on a sec. It's this one down here, the one with the cowboy on front. I think they've redesigned this cover, actually, when they reissued the album recently. But uh, this is the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, let's see. Uh, so Broderick Smith, uh, the one who, the, the guy who narrated on Sam Cherry's Last Shot, he returns and delivers this epic narrative throughout the album of a young white settler raised by Yavapai who becomes a fierce Native American outlaw in his own right, protecting Native Americans of the Western frontier from sadistic American colonial troops. He delivers it with all the gravitas of a dusty cowboy speaking to his friends around a campfire, and paired with the music, the effect is pretty neat. And speaking of the music, it is pretty damn cool, admittedly. Uh, the sonic textures explored on this album are nothing to sneeze at. There's a lot of reverb, a lot of me melodic guitar lines, along with the appropriate country western harmonica. The track Drum Run is, particular, uh, is in particular is a very pounding piece, with layers of percussion made to sound like a band of Native Americans on the hunt. Uh, Dust on the Wind has a pounding dual drum part which sounds like an outtake from the Mulgara fight music in Zelda Wind Waker. There are wind sound effects, uh, a, bar a barking dog on the killing ground, other soundscapes immersing you in the old American West. A lot of gunfire too, I think. Uh, hold on. I'm gonna turn on the lights in my room real quick. Take a sip of water. Okay. So, in terms of standout tracks on the album, I, I really do love the two lead-off tracks, Eyes Like the Sky and Year of Our Lord. Um, the former does a really good job of settling the atmosphere for the entire album, while the latter is just a groovy track with a killer bass lick. The raid is pretty neat, too, seeing the band inject a little garage rock giddy up into, uh, into the atmosphere. Personally, though, the album seems to slump for me after Evil Man. There aren't that many strong moments or riffs after that to accompany the narration, even if the music fits it all the same. I guess because of that, I, I don't know, it just kind of trails off. Just like the protagonist Eyes Like the Sky does, I suppose, into the Wild West for more adventures after leaving bands of US troops to die in the desert. Uh, the band want to make a sequel album to this. Broderick has actually already written the continuation, but given all the other shit the band's been up to and experimenting with since, I don't blame them for leaving this album on the back burner. Um, hold on a sec. Uh, yeah. So, overall, I think I'm gonna give this album a C. I... How to say. It's, it's, it's a great listen when you're in the mood for a Western experience, but don't necessarily want to watch a movie or play Red Dead Redemption 2. Outside of that, though, eh, I, I don't really come back to that this one that often. Like I said, the first two tracks are golden, but then my interest just sort of declines. Um, so... After that experiment, and probably realizing that it would be kind of absurd that early on in their career to add a 60-something-year-old man on tour for narration duties, the band decided to take a different, more psychedelic approach to their follow-up. The band recorded this in various home studios in the state of Victoria and were experimenting with guitars, synthesizers, odd time signatures, and probably a lot of catnip. Uh, and shit, probably acid, too. Uh, this album is such a heady rush, it's great. Where to start? Uh, well, probably with the gigantic uh, lead-off track that takes up pretty much a third of the album's runtime, Head on Pill. 
It starts as this mid-tempo psychedelic jam with this uh, hypnotic guitar drum in the background that wouldn't sound too out of place on a Brian Jonestown Massacre album, before suddenly exploding into this driving garage rock section where all the guitarists of the band just go ape shit on their instruments. Uh, Stu absolutely lets it rip with the feedback, while for the first time, I might add, the uh, dual drum configuration is doubling up on a drum part while throwing in individual fills here and there, yes. Eric Moore actually takes up the drums on this album alongside Caps. Uh, if that would become a staple sound of, uh, of King Gizzard in the years to come, you know. And, you know, seeing it live is always super impressive. You just have these two drummers going at the same time, playing essentially the same parts, and amplifying, like, just a bunch of drum sound. It was incredible. Um, but it absolutely, yeah, but in the context of the album, uh, Head on Pill, like, like I said, it takes up a good chunk of the album's runtime for what's essentially an extended jam. It certainly gets your attention, though, I, I will say that. For the rest of the album, the band ventures toward a more contained, even poppy, psychedelic sound. I Am Not A Man Unless I Have A Woman is a funny little song where Ambrose lets his feminine voice shine a bit. God Is Calling Me Back Home is an absolute stomper of a psychedelic song. Uh, 30 Past 7 is a delightful psychedelic tunnel of sorts full of reverb, sitars, drum parts with heavy cymbal crashes. Mystery Jackson underlooked track with a great low reverberant guitar riff. A lot of psychedelic delight contained in these tracks overall, and these are the and maybe these are only the ones that are just written by Stu McKenzie. Um, Ambrose actually contributes another song here in the form of Let Me Mend the Past, which is a very delightful, almost Motown-like pop song where he sings his heart out. It, it, I, in my opinion, it's one of the best he's contributed to to the band. But Ambi, uh, I do note a distinct lack of harmonica on this album. Uh, why is that? I mean, there could have been so many more interesting psychedelic textures here, uh, as we're going to get into later. Um, and then for the first time, we actually get a contrib contribution from the guitarist Cook Craig. And boy, uh, if you don't know Cook Craig, or Pipe Eye as he's known in other circles, uh, you're going to learn today. Dude has such a quirky, direct way of writing bedroom pop music that I love, and Pop in My Step is a great introduction to that. It's got this steady propulsion and the heady ascending riffs. Um, I recommend checking out Pipe Eye, his side project, in addition to uh, his work with King, King, King Gizzard, if you like his songs that in, in King Gizzard. He, really, really cool song, rather. Um, and then, after all these brilliant pop songs, we end with the six-minute title track, which feels like a very Indian-inspired track. The band seeming to lilt in 5-4 meter while playing these eastern-sounding guitar riffs and sitar riffs in the background, I think. Uh, the, the last few minutes where it's just the sounds of synth and sitar, it's, so, it's really so hypnotic. Uh, indeed, I think this album is the first to show the band taking on a musical influence from not just Western music, but music from other regions of the globe, and proves they can adapt these regional music's principles, if on Gizzard terms. Um, so. With all those songs out of the way, I suppose this is as good a time as ever to talk about the production. Uh, it's incredibly lo-fi in parts, and you're damn right that's intentional. <laughs> You'll hear sounds of assorted guitar feedback scattered throughout the album, or even studio chatter and clapping noises. It definitely feels like the band was studying up on their 1960s psychedelia before plugging into this album. Uh, they were so, there are so, so many rich sonic textures in spite of, or perhaps because of, the production. And uh, in the end, uh, even if I do think this album is kind of unbalanced and front-heavy because of the sheer uh, presence of Head on Pill as an opener, it's still a damn good album that showcases the band's growth as songwriters and experimentalists. It's a great chill album, especially the back end of it. I give it an A on the second. This one gets an A. Alright. Uh, uh, 
So after this, um, after Head on Pill, uh, not Head on Pill, Float on Fill Your, Float Along Fill Your Lungs, uh, Giz toured some more and then put out Oddments in early 2014, which apparently was a sort of mishmash of songs and ideas which were left behind from the past few albums. And, well, uh, hold on a sec, which one is that? Uh, Oddments is this one right here, the very, very trippy, bizarre, psychedelic cover. Uh, and not to spoil too much now, but God, does it feel like a mishmash? Um, this album ventures into arguably more psychedelic territories than uh, Float Along Fill Your Lungs did, which, uh, although it does so in a way which most of the time it's, it's weird. Just let me explain. So, the album opens with a psychedelic instrumental titled Aluda Magica, which is intercut with hoarse noises and samples from uh, a Bollywood film, which was apparently its namesake. Uh, the drums, bass, and keys are groovy, uh, but there's, there's so much goofy, odd shit to really get me to like it that much. Vegemite's another weird, goofy song about Australia's national condiment, which is all right, but it, feel, it feels kind of novelty. There are other odd moments like the random garage bursts of ABAB's CD and oddments. And also the album sounds very, very warped in most places, uh, with vocal filters galore and a very thin sound. Uh, Sleepwalker's a decent pop song, but again, it's dragged down by all the weird shit the band chooses to do with the background noise, and it takes like forever for them to actually get to the first verse of the song. It's, it's an incredible song to listen to while high on catnip. Otherwise, it's fine. Um, Cook Craig contributes two songs to this album, Crying and Pipe Dream. The former is apparently like one of the first songs he ever wrote and kind of annoying. Um, the nasally descending vocal line, the background blocking spiel, and the kind of weak rhythm section really drag the song down. The latter is just kind of a neat psychedelic outro, the latter, to, to the latter, so, well, they can't be all, they can't all be popping my step, I suppose. Uh, where the lo-fi, sometimes distorted production of, uh, works in the album's favor, though, is in its softer moments. Um, Stressin' is a, uh, mellow, uh, s soft rock song in the vein of, like, Mac DeMarco, uh, with a very chill, laid-back vibe. It's got old, it's an acoustic bluesy song about a troubled relationship with a fantastic melody and a superb harmonica lit by, a lick by uh, Ambrose. I, I really, really want to learn it. Uh, so if you hear me trying to howl on that on harmonica practice streams, uh, or howl something in the key of, oh geez, what is it? I can't think of it right now. Uh, but if you hear me attempt to butcher that song, that is why. Um, Homeless Man in Adidas, it's a surprisingly mellow, heartfelt acoustic number sung from the perspective of a, uh, well, a homeless man wearing Adidas. Um, and then there's Work This Time, which, if Spotify metrics are to be taken at face value, is probably King Gizzard's most well-known song. It's a lovely ballad with sparse drums, beautiful guitar work, and a restrained vocal by Joey Walker. It reminds me a whole lot of early Coldplay. It's, it's kind of like a Parachutes outtake, almost. And actually, there's a decent rock song, uh, well, there's a decent rock song in here with Hot Wax that sort of embraces the weird to its fullest. The Stu and Ambrose singing utterly absurd lyrics about, well, Hot Wax. While the guitars, bass, and drums play a hypnotic pop groove warped through various ripple effects and gigantic reverb. Incidentally, it also slaps live and played straight. It's just a very fun song. Overall, though, uh, this album is eh. I don't revisit it all the way through as though I would most other Gizzard albums. Just piecemeal. The highlights are good, but everything else around them is just... Well, it's an acquired taste, I guess. And, groove, and goofy and good fun, but given everything that's come after this, it just feels unrefined, unrestrained, amateurish. I give it a D. Uh, hold on. And B. Okay. Um. So, as we get into this part of the King Gizzard stream, I want to recommend the YouTube documentary, Bootleg Holiday from Hell, 
which follows King Gizzard on the road and in the studio for the next couple of albums through Nonagon Infinity. It's a fantastic snapshot in time of the band undergoing a tremendous evolution from a juvenile, a psychedelic garage act to the young wizards in the genre themselves. And man, the, the live footage is just so great. There's video of so many songs that never get performed live now, and it's so precious. Uh, but anyways, uh, it was after Oddments where King Gizzard really began to hone their professionalism as a band. For their next album, as opposed to cobbling songs together in various home studios, they'd get together as a band, write songs, rehearse them, and then record them in a professional studio environment. The result, released October 2014, was I'm In Your Mind Fuzz, which is probably the most cohesive King Gizzard album to date. Uh, for the first time, King Gizzard experiments with the idea of constantly segging from one song to the next on their albums, sometimes seamlessly from one song to the other. Uh, this is a really cool trick, and it's really exciting for their live shows, as I'll go into more a bit later. Uh, their first four tracks, called informally the Mind Fuzz Suite, but consisting of I'm In Your Mind, I'm Not In Your Mind, cell Cellophane, and I'm In Your Mind Fuzz, are a rush of garage psychedelia driven by a propulsive rhythm groove laid out by the sick recurring bass motif and dual drum part and but oh god the real part yeah the real treat is what the guitars and harmonica are doing they're shrieking they're wailing they're playing catchy riffs which are meant to get stuck in their head they're doing it together and this is King Gizzard arriving at what I think was their stride in finding the right balance of psychedelia and raw garage aggression uh, the studio distortions also return here, but they're more perfectly timed to go with the dynamic shifts in the music, and in this suite's case, aid the flow of the transitions between song and song. And the vocal lift, and the vocals, oh man, Stu is woo and and and, 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 and uh, he's embracing his wild man, and what a goddamn start to an album, these four tracks. Then before you know it, the, the suite fades off into a distance, and you enter the middle part of the album. You've got Empty, which is an underrated Gizzard song, I think. It's it's a very delightful psychedelic bopper, with, which grooves in, in a triple meter. And then there's Pop Water, which is this head bopper of a track driven by a spry flute riff. Oh, yeah, uh, Stu, he plays the flute. Um, he played it in a few of the songs also in the past, and I... I think, I think he had a few parts in For the Long, Fill Your Longs and Oddments, but it's here where he really begins to shine. There's this uh, part at the end of Hot Water where he just starts going off on a, Jeth on a, like on a Jethro Toll moment, and it's great. But then, oh man, Am I in Heaven comes and just blows you the fuck away. Uh, the acoustic intro is delightfully sing song -y. It's It lures you in a sense of giddiness before hitting you with this rushing train of bass, drums, and a chugging guitar. What unfolds next is crazy. There's feedback, there's the same motivic riffs throughout the album, and, and get used to it. They're going to be doing this a lot in the future. Uh, Ambrose squawks, he blows, he draws away on the harmonica, and Stu, he, he's singing about sucking on mother's breast. It's just a rush of a song and a bona fide classic. Uh, but after that rush, uh, the album sort of decides to chill out for the rest of the runtime. It starts with uh, Slow Jam 1, which is this nice slow song similar to some of the good ones on Oddments. Then it moves on to, to Satan Speeds Up, which again makes really good use of the studio distortion to accompany band dynamics, uh, shifting between menacing guitar riffs and nervous psychedelic pop brilliantly. And then the front. Sorry. Then the final track uh, is Her and I, Slow Jam 2, which is, is this uh, quirky, if charming love song with slick guitar work and a stunning climax where Ambrose delivers this final shrieking harmonica solo. And that's the end of the album. It's... Oh boy, does it feel like an album. You can tell, compared to everything that's come before, that they approached this album as a comprehensive project. They weave motivic riffs throughout the album. You know, you'll hear the same... Uh, you know, a lot of the riffs from Am I in Heaven show up in one form or another throughout the entire thing. Uh, and um, the kinks, uh, and, and it keeps a relatively uniform gizzard sound, the kinks which may float along fill your lungs of even and augment such a baffling psychedelic little nugget, uh, they've all been ironed out here, and what we're left with is a brilliant introduction into what the band could do with some discipline and ambition. 
I am ranking this album as a y as an S. This is essential Gizzard app listening right here. And I mean, look at this fucking album cover too. It's it's incredible. You got this uh, mountainside, these figures close, this menacing hand reaching in with uh, with lightning in the background. Classic psychedelia. I love this album. Um, Remember to keep hydrated, y'all. Just a reminder. Um, so, where would their newfound ambition take them next as a band? Well, back into the experimentation, I guess. Uh, and to challenge themselves, like on I Eyes Like the Sky, they aimed to make another album of four songs each, each 10 minutes and 10 seconds long, a quarter of the album's runtime. Uh, not only that, they ventured into jazzier, almost funky territory. So this album, excuse me, hold on. Uh, this album here, Quarters, was released in May 2015, and though the production is still as lo-fi as we've come to expect, it marked another pretty radical shift in the band's sound. Uh, these songs felt a bit more intricate, a bit more jam bandy, and I mean, I guess that makes sense. Each song is 10 minutes and 10 seconds. But how does that really play out in practice? Well, the first song, The River, it's absolutely impeccable, but it's set in 5-4 time for most, for the most part, which, if you're familiar with Dave Brubeck's Take 5, it's the same uh, sort of beat groove as that. It starts with a chill, swung verse chorus verse section, before picking up the pace for a slightly latin tinged middle section, with cascades of guitar riffs and solos, which feels like this rushing river. Uh, it then comes back with the same verse chorus verse structure from, before, from the beginning before veering for the last few minutes uh, into a straight groovy 4-4 jam. The sheer sonic contrast present present through the song with it an exciting listen every time for me, especially live. Uh, it's the, uh, live, they, they usually take this uh, fast uh, middle section like twice as fast. It's, it's really nuts. Uh, the song takes the album's 10 minute minimum and works with it perfectly to give us this musical experience which shouldn't be, which couldn't be possible with shorter psychedelic songs of before. But then the rest of the album, uh, though it is good, it doesn't quite stick the premise in the same way. Infinite Rise is this fun song with a great groove. It's got a bunch of sound effects related to the lyrics in the background, like a cat's meow, a clock ticking, a man yawning. Very charming. Uh, the guitars take a bunch of solos. Uh, cool as it is, though, it's essentially the same song for the entire 10 minutes, unlike The River, which sort of varies it up a bunch. Uh, God, in, God is in the River is also a great song. It's built on a chord progression similar to Led Zeppelin's Jamaica for the entire song, and the band, and the band does tend to vary it up considerably well with, again, multiple solo sections and verses and dynamic shifts, but... Again, it's essentially the same progression throughout the entire song. Um, Lonely Steel Sheet Flyers a beat track, and one which builds on the Eastern musical influence seen on their past albums. The, guitar, the guitars are nice and jangly, uh, there are some very relaxing, jazzy progressions, and the drums deliver a great performance, but again, and I'm sounding like a broken record here, the song stops and restarts again from the beginning section midway through. It doesn't really develop, so to speak. A lot of this album's runtime just sort of blurs together, and it can be a chill uh, listening experience, especially with a bit of catnip, but this is not the best set of songs the band's ever recorded. The band just sort of jams, and it's great. There are scores of songs out there that are far, far more offensive but, uh, which ha with how they've had their runtime. I'm looking at you, Oasis, and Be, 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 be Here Now. Uh, <laughs> But make no mistake, these songs, with the exception of the odyssey the band takes us on the river, are padded to shit. I'm going to give this album a C. Uh, one sec. Give it a C. Um, so as quarters, um, as quarters came together, the boys, sorry. Uh, as quarters came together, the boys were cooking to get, cooking up, um, 
another beast of an album in rehearsals and live shows. Uh, the, new sh the new songs which emerged around this period, uh, they had titles like Gamma Knife, Evil Death Roll, Robot Stop, and more. Uh, they were faster, they were more intense than the garage rock stuff they'd done before, and maybe a little more intricate than anything the band had done, like, psychedelic-wise today. As a result, it took some time to fashion uh, these songs into an album-ready, uh, presentable format in the studio. Uh, as the band continued uh, cutting their teeth on these tunes, they decided in the meantime to challenge themselves again and record an album using only acoustic instruments. And the result is something fucking great. Uh, from out of left field, they dropped this album here, Paper Mache Dream Balloon, in November 2015. This is perhaps the... Oh, hold on a second. Did, did I... Yeah, this album here, Paper Mache Dream Balloon, in 2015. November 2015. It's, I would say it's perhaps the most radical stylistic break in Gizzard engaged in since at least Eyes Like the Sky. Uh, it, is tangentially, it is tangentially related to their psychedelic inclinations in songs like The Bitter Bogey and Trapdoor, but this new acoustic Gizzard sounds like an almost entirely different band. I say almost because there are still obvious identifiers if you listen closely, you know, the driving rhythm section, vocal melodies which double the instrumental melodies, uh, weird studio sound effects. It's a brilliant reinvention for a few reasons. Uh, for one, this is a more introspective King Gizzard. Uh, the lyrics on this album reflect some morbid, existential, and philosophical shit. Uh, tracks like Bone, Dirt, Cold Cadaver, and Time Equals Money instantly come to mind. And, and most of the time, these lyrics will be sung over the, ha this will be like sung over the happiest uh, tracks this band's ever laid down. It's a very striking juxtaposition, which makes the lyrics hit even harder, in my opinion. Additionally, the limitation of their sound palette to only acoustic instruments forced them to get created in a different way than what they'd been used to on previous albums. Uh, there aren't electric guitars or basses, uh, sure, uh, but there also aren't any synths either. Consequently, you've got a wealth of different acoustic instrumental overdubs aside from the obvious guitar and bass, such as the double flute layering of Time Equals Money, uh, the iconic clarinet melody of Sense, Ambrose's willing harmonica in the bigger, bigger boogie, and the sweet dulcet sounds of an acoustic piano on multiple tracks. Uh, fast tracks like Cold Cadaver and NGRI, they rely on layers of harmonica, piano, flute, and acoustic guitar to match the wall of sound created before by just uh, electric guitars, feedback, and keys. And the thrilling effect. Uh, the flow on this album is just unreal, too. The album's total runtime is like 34 minutes, uh, which is spread out across 12 songs. Each song's about 3 minutes or less. Uh, often less, and none overstay their welcome. In fact, it's probably fair to say that this is King Gizzard's most accessible album. It's very indie folk friendly. In fact, I want to say my first exposure to King Gizzard was with Sense uh, sometime back in 2016, and, well, I thought it was alright, if nothing too impressive. Uh, certainly nothing to get me that interested to explore them further. And I guess that's the one knock against the album. Uh, even though they pretty much execute the concept perfectly, this is a great little album of amazing acoustic folk rock songs. They do, uh, they do do it a little too perfectly to the point where they sort of erase their own identity in the process, except to attentive listeners who know Giz. It's a great display of their songwriting skill, but I think that as a band, they are capable of a bit more. I'm going to give it an A. Um, uh, second here. Okay, uh, moving on. What else? Oh, here we go. So, all this time, while King Gizzard were still touring and figuring out the heavy complex shit, uh, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they were still working all these songs, you know, Evil Death Roll, uh, Gamma Knife, um, and they eventually settled uh, for this, this growing collection of tracks. They settled on the name Nanagon Infinity for their album, and another damn concept album at that. Uh, the album would loop. 
each song would lead into the next. And when it got to the last song, the end of that song uh, would pick up at the beginning of the first. There were nine tracks, hence Nonagon, which formed a looping chain of heavy psychedelic garage rock songs, uh, hence Infinity. It was perfect, really. Uh, thing was, it was also a bitch to rehearse and record, and nearly led to the breakup of the group. Uh, so this album, let me, uh, let me point it out. This album here, uh, was released, uh, in April of 2016, and was the only album King Gizzard released that year for a damn reason. Was all the out al- was all the effort worth it, though? I can safely say, fuck yes. Uh, Nonagon Infinity is not only my personal favorite King Gizzard album, I'm just gonna get it out of the way now. Uh, but it could probably be considered the band's magnum opus, their signature calling card album. For when somebody new is getting into them for the first time and wants to know, like, what's a good place to start, generally. Uh, this album takes all the heavy, complicated parts of the past few albums and boils them down to a perfect near 42 minutes of repeating music Crammed with so much energy and near effortless instrumental performance, you can't just you just can't help but be impressed listening to it even almost five years later. Jesus Christ, this album is five years old. Where does the time go? Uh, so right off the bat, right off the bat, this album starts with a central motif. Not a gun infinity opens a door. Not a gun infinity opens a door, and all that stuff before kicking off with a fucking bang on the track Robot Stop. Before long, you're being taken on this ride down all these impor- arpeggiated guitar riffs, this r- these rapid-fire motoric beats, the, the cybernetic vocal delivery from Stu. It's, it's incredible. Uh, there, there's an Indian sounding riff somewhere, the band quotes Hot Water, there's a lot of cool guitar feedback, and then almost seamlessly, it transitions into the next track, Big Fig Wasp and it just continues pummeling you with this heavy garage sound, calling back riffs from the previous song and even recapitulating it at the end. And Oh, did I mention that all of this is often happening as the band is hopping hopping between various time signatures, uh, 7-4, 9-4, and more? The band just can't get enough of rapid-fire time signature shifts on this album. And right after this, the band enters Gamma Knife, uh, which is one hell of a stomper. Even though it's written in 6-8 and 11-8, it's the sort of song you can headbang to as though it were just, like, 1-1. It's like, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Like, that's something I really love about King Gizzard's use of odd time signatures. They, They always feel like something that you can still groove to, even if they're, like, funky. Uh, even the extended drum solo in the middle of the song, um, it, uh, it feels danceable, and you can even feel the center of Cap's beat. And oh my god, can we talk about the guitar and harmonica synergy on this song, on this album? I don't think Ambie's been this involved, uh, in the group's harder rock stuff since Swell Bar Bruise, and it just sounds incredible. Oh my god. Okay. And people, people vultures. Uh, and people vultures continues from the previous song in a similar vein, with more foot stomping, uh, odd meters, and badass guitar riffs. Something I really love about this song is how uh, the organ synth layers with the guitars. Uh, That's that crunchy, deep purple sound you get uh, with that, like a lot of early rock bands that had a Hammond organ. And I love it. And also the intro and I guess ending riff of the song is sludgy and eerie in the vein of any great Black Sabbath riff. Uh, Just a little sidebar here. Uh, This band, uh, while they were making Nonagon Infinity, they also kind of wanted to do this uh, movie wherein they would film like music videos for every song. It didn't quite get off the ground. They only did, like, uh, Gamma Knife and People Vultures and one other song on this album that we're going to get to, but I highly recommend, if you love this album, if you love listening to this album, go check out the music videos for Gamma Knife and People Vultures. They are just so campy and ridiculous and such a fun time. (laughs) Um, So after four albums, so after four tracks... The album finally settles down a little bit with the quirky Mr. B. Uh, it's a cute, synth-driven song with an eerie underbelly. As the song light winds down, you can hear this emerging, ascending guitar riff 
uh, and a Nautilus Toppy, and I don't really care that much from Mr. Beat that uh, normally. It's it's decent as far as King Gizzard songs go, but it does well, it does work really well for its place on the album as a breather and as a prelude to the storm that is the next track, Evil Death Roll. Holy hell, is this song a tour de force. The guitar riffs, for one, have this great menacing bite while the dual drum parts plays ahead and uh, Stu is wooing and all that. The middle section foreshadows another song, it recapitulates not a gun infinity, opens the door, and all that. It has the metal section with the ascending guitar riff from the end of Mr. B, and then closes out the rest of the song with a bang before leading you into the next track, which is... Uh, okay, so this is a seven minute track. It's the longest song on the album, mind you. But it just keeps you on the edge of your seat the entire time, and of course, the lyrics are in the spirit of the Crocodile Hunter, all about Croc's defensive rolling maneuvers. This band does their Aussie blood proud. They even have like a cartoon alligator that serves as like their little mascot. It's, it's cute. Um, Invisible Face is this track. Uh, it, it's the track that comes next. And it's got a fun groove and an interesting middle section. Sort of leads into this soft Middle Eastern jazz interlude, reminiscent of the river before launching back into this heavier section. As an individual track, it, it probably it, it's probably the weakest on the album, but in the context of the album, I think, it, I think it works really well as a transition out of Evil Death Roll and into the next track, Wawa, which is a hell of a 5-4. Kind, kind of literally, actually. It's, the song is like the, the river if it was set to hell. Stu sings of sat satanic rituals while the guitar is doubled up by a, harp a harpsichord like synth uh, before the band unleashes these shrieks of torment on the guitar and harmonica, I think. And Stu blares the Zerna, which is a Turkish sort of horn that apparently he knows how to play uh, somehow. Trust me, the dude knows a lot of instruments. Uh, the melody of the chorus is also addicting as hell and will get stuck in your head. You know, wow, 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 Finally, the album ends with Road Trip, which is this steadily chugging song with galloping guitar and low western inspired vocals. It's like this twisted, amped up version of Rawhide. Uh, there are edits, I think, of this song set to footage of Mad Max Fury Road, and that's honestly the most apt visual representation I can think for this sort of music. It's the sort of track you listen to when you want to go on a hellish joyride with the lads. And then, of course, we need to talk about how it slows down, then builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, and builds until it explodes back in the tempo of Robot Stop, and before long it just ends, except it doesn't because, as you know, not a gun infinity opens the door. Not a gun. It just, just keeps repeating. Concept album achieved. This album is oh my god. Uh, it is an easy S in my book. Um, it's that it's probably King Gizzard's most brilliant realized concept album to date and definitive proof if you need it, that rock music, while not as mainstream today, is by no means a dead genre. Uh, the band wears all its influences on its sleeve on this album. Uh, yeah, Motorhead, Yes, Can, ACDC, Hawkwind, it's all there in the DNA of this music, just reconfigured in a way that those bands on their own would never have dared venture towards. It's such a rush of a listen, and definitely check it out. So like I said, after Nonagon, King Gizzard were done with releasing albums for the rest of the year. Uh, for the rest of 2016, I should say. Which I guess was, in hindsight, a heralding of how shitty that year was going to be. But that doesn't mean they weren't still writing new stuff. Uh, as they hit the road in support of Nonagon, they began workshopping new songs on the road about Lords of Lightning and crumbling castles, and before long, the band... They, they found themselves facing down multiple albums worth of ideas, so... They did what any sensible band would do, and announced that in, in that November, uh, that in 2017, to make up for the uh, relative lack of new material, they would be releasing five new albums. Sorry, uh, did I say sensible? I meant utterly bonkers! But this is Ken Gizzard we're talking about here, after all that totally tracks. 
Uh, so the first album of 2017, released that February, was yet another radical sonic shift as the band began experimenting with microtones. Uh, they were modifying their instruments to play microtones. And for those of you who don't know what, uh, uh, for those of you who aren't versed in music theory, uh, microtones are essentially notes which are between the 12 pitches that we normally associate with Western tonality, with, with Western music. Uh, microtonality is typically more associated with the Eastern musics of like the Middle East or India. Um, and, and so this experimentation is basically right in line with what the band was doing before on like Float Along, Fill Your Lungs or, uh, or even Quarks. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a logical progression in my eyes. Uh, the result is this album, Flying Microtonal Banana, which is an album of classic gizzard psychedelia filtered through the lens of Anatolian rock. That is, uh, Turkish rock, if you're not a geography nut and don't know what the Anatole or Anatolia or that stuff is. <laughs> um, I should mention also, uh, they, the band put out a documentary, a making of documentary, uh, Peeling the Flying Microtonal Banana. That's pretty cool. They show, uh, you know, it's a behind-the-scenes breakdown showing off, like, their modified gear and, like, the recording process. It's got a bunch of cute jokes. Um, but, anyways, how does this microtonal experiment work in practice? Well, overall, pretty good. Very good, very good. Uh, the, ov the opener track, Rattlesnake, is an absolute banger, and it's, it's got the most, uh... I should say, one sec, this is the album we're talking about here, The Flying Microtonal Banana. Um, yeah, but as I was saying, Rattlesnake is an absolute freaking banger with the most absurdly simple chorus. Rattlesnake, 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 Rattles me. It's, it's fucking great. Excuse me. Uh, the band moves through riff after riff after riff in classic gizzard fashion, backed by another driving motorist beat. But the microtonal sound is, and slightly chilled tempo, it gives the song a more dusty, desert rocky vibe. It's like Evil Death Roll, but about snakes instead of gators, and there are all sorts of microtonal sounds. Piano, wah-wah guitar, and the Zerna making its return from Nanagon Infinity. Uh, definitely a great way to lead off the album, I think. The next track, Melting, is also a fantastic uh, song. It, it's built on this groovy Latin sound beat and incorporating these crazy ascending microtonal riffs played by keys and doubled up sometimes on guitar. It's a hell of an infectious groove and an overall pretty chill lesson, but then the album veers straight back in, uh, into like straight ahead rock with a head bopper open, open water. It's driven by Stu McKenzie, who's playing this repetitive hypnotic guitar part, and he, he plays like, he, he plays no chords, and it sounds like he's playing like an electric oud, almost like a guitar. An oud is like this, uh, I think it's like one, maybe two stringed uh, uh, instrument. It, it sounds really rustic and stuff. It's cool. Uh, so the soundscape, it, Open Water is pretty cool, because it combines like that very, uh, hypnotic guitar line with these soundscapes of open sea. Uh, it, it's paired with like the heralding sound of the Zerna later. And all these add tension to the song, which is only fitting because this song and the one before it, Melting, uh, they both address climate change and its adverse effects, which is a theme that King Gizzard is going to be coming back to a lot in songs to come. So stay, stay tuned. Uh, and then after leading off with these three pretty jam-heavy tracks, I, I'd say, the album opts for more straightforward songs with tracks like Sleep Drifter, Billabong Valley, and Nuclear Fusion. This part of the album absolutely rips because much like Rattlesnake, these songs make you feel like you're on a road trip through a desert. Uh, the plethora of slick riffs on Sleep Drifter, the Wawa Race breakdowns of Doom City, the, co the coordinated hi-hat work between the dual drums on Nuclear Fusion, the twisted if funky grooves on an on, 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 Anoxia, and so much more. Uh, it, it shows this band operating in a new comfort zone with these microtonal instruments, uh, creating music that doesn't just rock, but aspires to reach across genres. Uh, as if to sum up that sort of album thesis, um, 
The final track on the album, which is the title track, is a Zerna-driven instrumental in 74, backed by this droning guitar riff. Uh, so the album, while another radical departure from Gizzard's signature sound, it shows more continuity with this sound than efforts like, say, Paper Mache Dream Balloon. Um, that said, the band were still growing into the, their microtonal instruments, and kind of like Float Along, Fill Your Lungs, this, su this album suffers from a lopsided bounce, where the first three of the nine tracks take up like half the album's runtime, because there are so many extended jam parts and riff upon riff, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I like these songs just fine, but it may be more exhausting for new listeners. I'm going to give this album an A. So, there's that. What else? Sorry. Uh... Um, uh, sorry, do it here. Okay, so, that's one album out of the way for King Gizzard's 2017. Uh, their next would only take a few more months to materialize, but when it did in June... Holy shit. Um, nearly half a year after they made Nonagon, the band decided to double down even harder on that sound for another album. But this time, with a twist. There would be narration. The band enlisted the help of Australian folk singer and flightless label mate uh, Leia, Leia Senior and a random text-to-speech program in order to convey three short stories told through these three distinct suites of tracks. Uh, you have The Tale of the Altered Beast, The Lord of Lightning vs. The Balrog, and Han Tayumi and the Murder of the Universe. Uh, the finished product would receive a, fiddling, a fittingly grandiose title, uh, ripped from a lyric from one of the suites, uh, Murder of the Universe. And holy hell, this, this album rocks just as hard as Nonagon Infinity does, if not even more so. Uh, the Tale of the Altered Beast is this 19-minute epic, released with multiple time signature shifts, motivic repeated guitar riffs, crushing guitar tones, dramatic organ, and breakneck dual drum magic. It may be my favorite set of tracks the band has ever recorded. I especially love Altered Beast 3, where the band at one point just drops into this sludgy riff worthy of Black Sabbath, as the narration describes the sweet protagonist transforming into an Altered Beast, which is this creepy thing that's been stalking him through the entire suite. And despite how long the suite goes on for, not once does it feel dull. The band is continually recapitulating these, yes, but it's also adding new ones to chase, change up the pace, and it, it's just such a great set of tracks. Before we move on to the next suite, some context is needed. Kind of ironic, since uh, the first track of the next street, the suite is, ironically, is titled uh, Some Context. Uh, do you know what Xenocrony is? Uh, so, it's essentially this music concept where uh, you take a part uh, from, that was recorded in one song and then drop it into a new, an entirely different song uh, randomly and sort of, um, you know, to get like cool, a cool harmonic or rhythmic effect going. Um, well, King Gizzard, they are huge fans of Sinacrity. And I mentioned this when we discussed uh, Mind Fuzz, and briefly when we talked about Nonagon, uh, I said how Robot Stop has a little riff from Hot Water, um, but they'll sometimes take riffs from older songs and add them to new songs, uh, not only to seamlessly transition between songs and get audiences hype at live shows, and trust me, it fucking works, uh, but to connect their songs in a broader musical universe. Fans call this the Gizverse, and are divided on how literal it is. You've got all these videos on YouTube explaining how every Giz album post Nonagon is connected, while other fans, uh, like me, would prefer to judge the albums on their own merits before definitely putting them in a broader context, but, I mean, on the other hand, the band definitely tease it. I'll explain why later. So, I say all this because The Lord of Lightning vs. Balrog, while it has fantastic tracks in its own right with The Lord of Lightning and The Balrog, yo, Black Redneck, how's it going? Uh, we are, how many albums in now are we right now? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
We are 10 albums in uh, to uh, King Gizzard's 18 album discography. Just about halfway through. More than halfway through, actually. How are you doing, man? Good to see you. Um, what else? Sorry, where was I? Um, yeah, uh, so the Lord of Lightning and Barog, it, it's loaded with synacrity. It literally begins with the ending riff of People Vultures. Uh, both, it, and it both, uh, well, how to say? It, it, yeah, it, it, it starts with the ending of People Vultures before seamlessly setting into this narration part by Leia Senior. And, uh, then it enters the Lord of Lightning, which is this fantastic garage psych song in the vein of People Vultures, with one of his, uh, uh, how to say, it, 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 it name drops Nanagon Infinity mid-song, and then it splices in the main riff of I'm In Your Mind at the end, leading into the next track, uh, the ball rock, which is this fiery rocker with a phenomenal bass part. Uh, it quotes Trapdoor in its end part, and maybe even uh, People Vultures in one of its riffs. But that's a bit of a more tenuous connection. The uh, Trapdoor connection is definitely there. Uh, regardless, the second suite is fantastic music to accompany the story of two mythic titans clashing, made all the more fresh and exciting by its musical ties to past Gizzard musical work. I am good, my dude. That's good. That's good to hear. Uh, how's your day been? What have you been getting up to? Oh, what else? Um, there's one more sweep uh, to talk about on this album. Um, but uh, let's address the elephant in the room first, the album's narration. Some people, including fans, are extremely critical of the narrative sections. They'll throw around tough terms like post audiobook and criticize Leia Senior for being monotone, but I think they misunderstand. The narration of this album fucking rocks and adds more drama to an already dramatic musical score. A uh, senior, while narrating as the altered beast, is effective at selling the creepiness of the monster and, while narrating the fight between the Lightning Lord and the Balrog, uh, at giving a shell, rock, a shell shot to the recollection of mass destruction. Uh, I think that's the whole principle of Less is More in action. Uh, if the delivery here had been a bit hammier, or had not existed at all even, uh, the music would suffer as a result. The narration, I would argue, is what holds this entire album together, dare I say. <laughs> In fact, the next suite, uh, which uses the text-to-speech machine as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's a good example of that. Uh, Han Tayumi and the Murder of the Universe introduces us to a cyborg uh, named Han Tayumi, uh, who narrates his desire to vomit and creates a machine to do so. Uh, but the machine hates puking, so Han Tayumi plugs himself in directly and pukes so much that he coats the entire universe in vomit and causes it to collapse. Yeah, it's fucking absurd. It rocks, though. Uh, total headbanging music. Uh, Digital Black, Vomit Coffin, and the closing track, Murder of the Universe, are probably the most direct the band has come to playing straight up metal as opposed to garage rock since their formation. Uh, it's especially effective on Murder of the Universe, where the band just gets heavier and heavier as the universe collapses under their weight of uh, Pantayumi's vomit, and his voice gets more and more distorted in the background. It's an appropriately chaotic ending to a chaotic album. Uh, this album, oh man, uh, oh wait, was I, I think I was highlighting the wrong. This is the proper album art for it. It's <laughs> an appropriately uh, uh, chaotic album art for an appropriate, uh, appropriately chaotic album with an appropriately chaotic album. Uh, I can't speak today, but an appropriately chaotic ending. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, this album, it is my favorite King Gizzard album. It, it offers so much in its 46 minute runtime. The instrumentalists, like Ananagon Infinity, are firing on all cylinders, but they're channeling this energy into conveying epic Dungeons and Dragons style narratives with the sonic weight that they deserve. This is such a good TTRPG album. In fact, I even nicknamed a character I played once the Lord of Lightning in honor of this album. That was a that was a long time ago in a TTRPG. I don't think it was Dungeons and Dragons. 
But if you love music with a more of a narrative flair, with more of a dramatic flair, I want to say, or hell, just heavy, complex rock music in general, this is an incredible album. It gets an S. One second. There we are. I am planning to make a future collab in VTuber 5 podcast, but I don't know that. That's really cool. I like the idea of a VTuber podcast. If you ever had guests, I'd be glad to come on sometime. Uh, not to invite myself on anyone's program or whatever, but, you know, it'd be cool to, uh, be cool to collab around in the community. But, moving onwards... Uh, for their third album of 2017, King Gizzard decided that, for the first time and so far the only time, they would produce a collaborative album with another band, The Mile High Club, uh, which, if you don't know who they are, they're essentially this jazz rock band, uh, jazz rock, psychedelic rock, uh, they're also Australian, um, and, uh, their album, Skip Tracing, if, uh, of course, this is, again, outside the scope of this video, but if you like good psychedelic pop music with, like, a jazzy, funky undertone, je definitely check that album out. It's great. Um, but anyways, uh, a collab between uh, them and King Gizzard, it had been gestating, uh, can add you in the podcast if you have the time. Yeah, well, I mean, keep it, of course we keep in touch, you know, we... We're in the Discord together, so I'm sure uh, I'm sure we'll figure something out. Um, yeah, uh, the collab it had been gestating for some time since they've been touring together briefly before, uh, and I, I think actually there's there's some footage on the bootleg Holiday from Hell of an early version of one of the songs on this album, Rolling Stones. But it wasn't until the summer of 2017 that this co collaboration bore fruit. Of course, King Gizzard had dabbled in jazzier territory before, uh, Quarters in particular comes to mind, but this album, uh, hold on, which album? Uh, this album here, uh, it, it's in line more with the, uh, it's in line with the more relaxed, chill vibes than other, uh, Mild High Club albums. Uh, and it was to be groovier, more chill, more cleanly produced. Uh, the result, uh, Sketches of Brunswick East, came out in August 2017. Uh, now this album's general vibe is, as it says on the tin, an impressionistic look at the life in the suburb of Brunswick East in Melbourne. Its title is kind of cribbed from a Miles Davis record titled uh, Sketches of Spain, uh, which is, I think it's a classic jazz album. I don't know if I've ever listened to that one all the way through, but it's like a very, like, flamenco, uh, jazzy, Spanish-y album. Anyways, uh, getting out of that tangent, um, there's a recurring suite of title tracks on this one. Um, uh, it, it, uh, you know, each title of Sketches of Runs with Beast, one, two, three. It, it each features a lovely flute melody from Stu, playing off of various textures like a bouncy bass line, a detuned old piano. Uh, it's very texturally interesting stuff. Other tracks like Cook Craig's Lil T Beautiful Dawn to Dusk on Ligon Street it reference the suburbs directly while Crane's Planes and Migraines, A, Dirty, uh, a Journey to Shell, and Rolling Stone are more transitory instrumental tracks representing wacky experiences in the suburb. Um, Rolling Stone is a groovy jam with another tasteful flute melody by Stu, but the former two really only work in the context of the album, uh, Cranes, Planes, and Migraines, and A Journey to Shell. They're not the most essential King Gizzard tracks otherwise. I mean, I'm not a Melbourne native, let alone in Australia. Uh, uh, I don't know. Those tracks might do more for Australians than for me. <laughs> uh, the band also dabbles in microtones again, just in case you thought their interest was a one-time thing. Uh, there are two microtonal tracks on this album, uh, D-Day and The Book. The first is groovy with a neat melody of just another minute 30 second transitory track, while the book is a funky little track about doomsday preachers with this extended breakdown in the metal with timbales and wind sound effects. It's a very fun track which shows the band continuing to mine microtones for more worldly influence. 
Um, honestly, where this album really shines, I think, are in the song collaborations. Uh, songs like Countdown, Tezita, and The Spider and Me are feature a trademark, gives her time signature switching and vocal melodies doubled up in instrumentals. Only this time, as is, I guess, to be expected of a jazz fusion release, the production is the best it's ever been, so all the vocals, all the drum tracks, all the guitars and basses come through crystal clear, and they sound fascinating. It's all soft, chill giz too, in the vein of slower tracks from Oddments and Mind Puzz, so they're all chill listens, even the slightly ominous bossa tinge you can do your silhouette, which kind of grows into this, uh, troubled whimper as it descends uh, further and further in the end. But overall, I do... I do like this album. It's a very chill listen, but it gets so bogged down in the process of being an album experience that some tracks don't really leave much of an impression beyond the album, whereas with Nanagyan, you could really only argue one track was weak outside the context of the album. Uh, I feel strongly about that way, about at least three tracks on this album. So don't sleep on it, but uh, uh, but do understand, it's got a lot of fleeting moments. I'm going to give it a B. Okay, so, um, clearly, uh, King Gizzard had a pretty productive summer in 2017. Uh, almost four years, uh, four years, excuse me. Almost four months left to go in 2017. Remember, we're at, like, August right now in the timeline. And they'd already put out three albums or of their five that they promised. Now, if this were another psychedelic garage rock septet, they might have seen this and gotten the idea to sort of play it safe here. Maybe, you know, make two easy effort releases in the vein of Mind Fuzz, or maybe even Murder of the Universe. Like, real garage rockers. But if this stream has taught you anything by now, it should be that this band refuses to do anything that is easy. So, um, they had this song that they've been playing live, Crumbling Castle, right? It was built heavily on polyrhythms, and as, it, as they got more ideas for polyrhythmic sections in the songs, and then got more polyrhythmic ideas for other songs in general, they realized suddenly Oh shit, boys, we have a prog rock album on our hands. <laughs> and the result of these efforts, Polygon's Wanderland, was released four months later, in November of 2017. I mean, granted, the boys were also, they also had a heavy touring schedule around this time, too, that they had to keep up with, you know, promoting Murder of the Universe and whatnot. So it's not like they had, like, a lot of spare time to be going into the studio, but... The fact that they challenged themselves in this way to do very musically intricate stuff, it's just... It's it's, it's, it's nutso, I love it. The results... Yeah, yeah. Polygon's Wanderland. Um, it was released in November, but... Well, I say released, but in reality, it was more just like, entered into the... Do, do you like E... Sorry, Bye Bye Becca. Do you like EDM slash dubstep music? If so, who is the name of your favorite art? You know, I haven't listened to that much EDM or dubstep. I'd be, uh... You know, I'd be interested in getting into more. Of course, I do love, like, Daft Punk and, I guess, Justice. <laughs> you know, d sort of dance... You know, I guess, entry-level dance music, that sort of thing, but... You know, I, I really can appreciate, like, electronic soundscapes and nice electronic beats. Um, if anything, I think my favorite electronic uh, genre is closer to, like, Vaporwave and Future Funk and that sort of heavy stampled stuff. Like, Plunder Phonics, essentially. Um, like, I guess, uh, I haven't listened to too, too much of them, but I, I've heard a few tracks by The Avalanches. They're pretty good, and I, I would definitely recommend them. Uh, oh, so I, I keep getting distracted, sorry. Uh, but, yeah, when they released this album, they didn't so much release it as to just directly enter it into the public domain. They said, like, this album is free, download it, press uh, vinyl records with it, make cassettes out of it, make tapes out of it, and sell it on your own indie labels. And, you know, people responded. There are, like, so many freaking pressings out there. 
of uh, Polygon's Wonderland and so many different kind colored vinyls. We've got cassette versions, VHS versions. You know, I remember, I, I am old enough of a boomer to remember um, back in the day when Radiohead released In, Ra in Rainbows online for a pay-what-you-want model. But this, man, oh, Pink Gizzard is nothing if not full of surprises. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot to highlight the album cover. It's this album down here, the, one, the really trippy one. Again, Jason Galea, uh, he's a really cool artist. He's sort of, he, he's outdone himself in a lot of these Gizzard albums. Uh, but yeah, this is the release of this album, Gizzard, King Gizzard are nothing if not full of surprises. Speaking of surprises, holy shit, the musicianship on this... Oh, I didn't mean to sad face. The musicianship on this album, oh my god. Uh... So, uh... As I mentioned, the band were experimenting a lot more with pollinators at this time, and that is... That is to say, different musical voices playing different rhythmic, rhythmic meters at the same time. Uh, that's a bunch of drummer talk, a bunch of rhythmic talk for uh, a bunch of shit happening uh, uh, at once that all just sort of locks together in the end. <laughs> uh, but, let me say, um, this album's got, it's got a lot. It's got duples on top of triples, it's got triples on top of duples, it's got compound meters over compound meters, it's got all sorts of crazy time signatures, and like on Nanagon and Murder before, the band moves in, in and out of them so damn quickly. So take a look here, I've got, um, on Reddit I, ha I found um, this image here by the... Uh, hello. I don't know. Are we back? Okay. I think we're back. Sorry. OBS just sort of crashed on me. Uh, Black Redneck, I just find you on Twitter, so uh, it's good to see my name everywhere. I just make my Twitter because I never used Twitter before. Sorry. No, that's all good, man. You know, I always appreciate you coming around my streams. It's good to have regulars. Um... Anyways, let's get back into things. As I was saying, with Crumbling Castle, uh, it's, it's the lead-off track on this album, and it's just a behemoth of a song at over 10 minutes in length. It explores all sorts of sonic textures and meters between the various instruments. Uh, you know, from spar it goes from sparse rhythmic interplay, sending soft chanting from the band, to prominent use of Mellotron-like synth sounds, to familiar psychedelic garage freakouts, to a full-on heavy metal breakdown at the end. And meanwhile, yeah, you've got this all this freaking rhythmic analysis going on. It just well, all this freaking rhythmic uh, interplay going on, and. It's almost flawless. The instruments are weaving in and out of each other multiple times throughout the song, to the point you could probably find the Pyth Pythagorean theorem somewhere in there. And I just want to emphasize right now, this is the same band that gave us Footy Footy. This was the track. This was the track that got me into King Gizzard. You know, I said that Sense was probably the first King Gizzard track that I listened to, but no. This is the first King Gizzard track that I got into. Of course, you all know my musical taste, so when I discovered this godly, heavy prog rock song with psychedelic overtones in the fall of 2017, I immediately plunged, plunged down the rabbit hole. You know, I think I listened... I think Polygon's Wonderland had actually come out recently, and I listened to that and, like, Nonagon Infinity were, like, my next two big King Gizzard albums. Yeah, I was hooked. Oh my god, I was so hooked. Uh, the rest of the album, though, uh, it's nothing to sneeze at either. You'd like Murder, there are three suites of songs. The first includes tracks like Polygon's Wonderland, uh, The Castle in the Air, Deserted Dunes, Welcome Weary Feet, and it documents a pilgrimage to the titular Polygon's Wonderland. Uh, Leia Sr. even returns for a narrative bit in The Castle in the Air, and 
the sweet, it's, it's a fantastic uh, way of demonstrating something neat about Polygon's Wonderland. Uh, wait a minute. It's fantastic at demonstrating something neat about the album, rather. Uh, the band leaned more heavily into, di into dynamic and sonic contrast, this album, and they're used to acoustic guitars and sequencers. Uh, they create, it creates a more open, expansive sound in areas, which contrasts well with the heavy guitar verse elsewhere. This is an album where Stu woos considerably less, in other words. I mean, the woos are still there, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, it's planned better. Uh, the quick, electrifying Deserted Dunes is a welcome payoff after the preceding two tracks of flute and synthesizer textures, backed by the dual drums polyrhythms. And then you got the second suite, which consists of tracks in your cell, royalty, and horology. Um, and, and, this, uh, and this warps the listener to this dystopian future rife of secrecy and sabotage, if you listen to the lyrics closely. Uh, this series of tracks has some really fantastic uh, psychedelic proggy moments. Uh, you got this a bass solo in Loyalty, which is the obvious candidate, uh, but I also love parts like the drum part on Inner Cell, uh, the ascending sequencer part that begins Loyalty, and the chanting that closes out Horology. And it definitely points to the next set of tracks, so you got continuity that way in the album. Uh, the final set of tracks, though, it consists of Tetrachromacy, Searching, and The Fourth Color. And it concerns a narrator from, I think, the previous suite, discovering how to see a fourth primary color. The first two tracks are these really groovy, chill, psychedelic tracks in comparison with the most of the rest of the album, taking the listener through the slow, arduous process of looking for the fourth color themselves. Uh, searching, in particular, reminds me a bunch of Tool's softer moments. Uh, it uses all this aux percussion, including what sounds like a tabla as a backdrop to these wandering synth noises and a steady drum and bass groove. Um, but then, when that fog lifts, the band rockets in the fourth color, a rapturous finale with yet more harmonic chanting and one hell of a guitar riff. Also, much of the band, and much of the drum part here is sort of cribbed from Deserted Dunes, but that's fine since I honestly think it goes better in this song's verses anyways. It also has a fake out ending where the band comes rushing back in with a final garage freak out before we hear, Ken Tayumi? Oh my gosh. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is King Gizzard acknowledging the Gizverse they laid the groundwork for with Nanagon and Murder. Uh, and it would not be the last time. They really seem to like Hantayumi, and actually, they acknowledged his existence before Murder of the Universe in the video for Robot Stops, so this puking cyborg is something of an unofficial mascot for them. Officially, they tend to represent themselves with a the cartoon gator, but I mean, I think a vomiting cyborg that has the ability to see a fourth color is a bit cooler, don't you? Uh, but anyways, overall, uh, let's get this, uh, let's get this, uh, not to your list. Uh, let's get this, um, analysis down. Very helpful. Thank you again to u slash Jane Burroughs on Reddit. Um, Overall, this album is just fucking incredible. Uh, the story of King Gizzard is as much the story of a group of seven Australian musicians progressively getting more confident in their instrumental abilities as it is the story of a band dabbling in multiple genres throughout their career. Uh, through their past effort, though their past efforts had included elements of prog rock, this, I think this is where they took their first full plunge into its depths and the result is something beautiful merging the energy and psychedelia of their heavier efforts uh, with the jazz and complexity and sonic experimentations of their softer efforts. And they put this out for free, man. They put this out for free. That's zero dollars. I'm giving this album an S just because it's such a brilliant moment in their career. Yeah, you might be uh, you might be able to tell by now. I've got a bias against. I've got a bias for this band. Uh, already, I've got more S tier albums up there than the King Crimson video. Uh, but by now, uh, by now in 2017, the band were in a bit of a pickle. They were only a month out from the end of the year, and they still needed to deliver on the promise of another album. 
The group were hard at work through Christmas, putting together a final effort, and managed to get album number five, Gumboot Soup, out on December 31st. It's the album over here, which, you know, it's got a sort of river downstream coming from, a river of notes coming downstream from a boot. Um, how's a... Yeah, yeah, this one. Um, but, um, that is pretty suspicious. It's a pretty quick turnaround time from the end of Polygon's Wanna Land, considering they were also touring uh, throughout 2017. The twist? Gumboot Soup is another cutting room floor album. A la Oddments. Oh. Oh boy. Thankfully, uh, I will get this out of the way now. This album isn't nearly as aggravating or weird as Oddments, by sheer virtue of the band having simply become better songwriters since 2014. There are a few annoying psychedelic flourishes anywhere, and all the tracks are perfectly listenable. That said, it still has its share of pacing issues and songs which are just... eh. For instance, uh, there are two microtonal songs on this album which didn't make Flying Microtonal Banana. One of them, always known, is an absolute garage banger like off the 12 bar blues, uh, just microto uh, uh, 12 bar blues, rather, just microtonal. The other, Greenhouse Heat Death, is a fine sludgy jam but probably the weakest microtonal track the band had conceived that year. Uh, there are a few more jazzy slash funky tracks on the album, which likely didn't make the cut for the Mild High Club collab. Uh, some are great, like the opening Casino Tragedy, Beginner's Luck, uh, the underrated Flute Coated song, uh, Barefoot Desert, and Cook Craig, he's got this funky little tune called Down the Sink. Others, like the mild synth chugger superposition and the undercooked jazz chord progression on The Last Oasis, they're a bit more lacking. Uh, in hindsight, the band's experiments with synths here were foreshadowing their synth aspirations to come. Hell, uh, Superposition and I'm Sleeping In, they, they wouldn't sound too out of place on Butterfly 3000, even if they are somewhat rudimentary. Yeah, I, I do like su uh, I'm Sleeping In a bit. It's, it's a decent song. Other than these tracks, though, there's Muddy Water, which is an absolutely bluesy jam with, with a fantastic driving drum part and a call and response uh, chorus. It absolutely rips, especially live. Now, you've got uh, The Great Chain of Being, which is King Gizzard taking the metal influence of Murder the, of the Influence and cranking it up to essentially 11. To I, I've already used that joke in here, haven't I? Damn. To deliver us a decent doom metal song. Last, lastly, though, there's the closer, the wheel, which is a pretty nice note quarter like 7 4 ballad with great vocals from Ambrose. Some people are really crazy about this song, and, you know, it's good, but I just, I just kind of think it's fine. It's better live for sure. That's, oh, just to say now, uh, the, the band has also these, uh, wait, yeah, the band has these, uh, studio uh, live sessions uh, from the Seattle radio station, KEXP. Uh, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube of these sessions, and they're just like some of the most, some of the most phenomenal uh, live performances you'll ever see a band do. Like, and they're, and they're fantastically produced too. Like, I guess Stu always gets the masters for them and does his own mixing, and, and they always sound just great. So if you have the time and you're really getting into King Gizzard, uh, do listen to the KEXP sessions because they, they they are a rush. And there's a ver there's a KEXP session where they did a version of the wheel, and it sounds so so much more energetic and lively. I love it. Um, so the songs overall on Gumboot Soup, they're they're pretty good. They're not King Gizzard's best, but they're great in their own right. What really hampers Gumboot Soup to me is its lack of continuity as an album. Not since Float Along For Your Lungs have we received a King Gizzard album where the songs don't really lead into one another through studio trickery or natural, natural musical sakes. And because this album is a variety album, you know, cutting room floor and whatnot, this really kills its pacing. There are odd choices in track listing, like 
greenhouse heat death right after beginner's luck, all is known after the last oasis, and especially the great chain of being after down the sink. I can't view this album. I, I can't this I can't view this so much as an album. Uh, as a collection of all right to great songs. And compared to what King Gizzard was putting out for the past few years, for the past year, hell, I don't really see as much a reason to revisit this one as a full album. I'm going to give it a C. Okay. So, ep after the epic year that was 2017 for King Gizzard, the band didn't put out anything in the entirety of 2018. Uh, they instead spent most of that time touring. Actually, hold on, let me take a sip of water real quick. Okay. Yeah, they instead, like, they, they toured basically the entirety of 2018. And I actually got to see them um, in Philly when they swung by their uh, North American when they swung by on their North American tour, and they brought uh, they brought the freaking house down. Um, I actually got to meet uh, Stu McKenzie backstage. Um, and after that live show, I was just wiped out. So I went up to him and I was like, "Dude, you guys are fucking incredible. How the fuck do you do this every night? Like, and give like 110 percent like this?" And he's like. I don't know, mate. My, my, foot, my foot's kind of fucked up, too. You know, he's just... <laughs> that was a horrible Australian impression. I'm sorry if any Australians are listening to this. But yeah, he was just, like, humble about the entire thing and just an all-around really chill dude sticking around, talking with a bunch of the fans after the show. Really, really cool band. Really nice guys. Um, but yeah, like, night after night, they were blitzing through all these complicated tracks they were laying down in the past year. But all the same, new ideas were always floating around in the back of their heads. In fact, I think I remember, like, a live bootleg from early on in 2018 where they were supposed to be playing a new song, but it was just, you know, it was just sort of a garage scrap that somebody recorded, and it was more of a jam, if anything. <laughs> um... You know, people were just that hungry for Gizzard material after, you know, them releasing album after album after album in 2017. But, uh, unbeknownst to us, the band, sometime in 2018, I'm thinking later in the year, gathered in the Australian outback to cook up a more rustic album. Something which tapped into the bluesier side of the band's music, the dancier side, the urge to boogie. Eventually, in February of 2019, the band broke their silence with the release of the synth pop track Psy Boogie. Yes, I said synth pop. Psy Boogie is such a fun track which continues the synth experimentation seen on previous albums, dialing it up even further with Stu's vocoded robot like singing. Psy Boogie, man, then it don't, and all that. <laughs> Uh, and for those who were into that sort of thing, the song also teased the Giz verse, with Han and Tayumi's voice slowed down and reversed at the end. Uh, the single was also released with a B-side, Acarine, and, which was a synth-weighted polyrhythmic song almost along the lines of Polygon Wonderland with a howling harmonica part courtesy of Ambrose. Even more surprising, however, was Oh my god, Acarine, it had this extended EDM outro, which still bangs, even two years later, like, yo, Black Redneck, if you're still here and you're still listening, like, dude, like, it's like this 5-4 EDM groove that absolutely bops, and it leads right out of this song, it's, you know, it's a completely left-field turn, but it works, surprisingly. Um, these two tracks, though, they hinted not just that continuity within the band's broader musical mu uh, universe, but within the direction of their uh, experimentation. Needless to say, there was a lot to be excited about in going into the spring. And then more of the album was revealed through singles and leaks, and, well, it's interesting. Uh, we thought we were getting an electronic-tinged album at first. Uh, but it gradually became apparent that the album would be more influenced by roots music and blues. Uh, and that is this album here, Fishing for Fishies. Um, 
kind of, not that it, not that the album was more bluesy, not that that's a bad thing or anything, you know. It, it, it's just that the Gizzard Synth album was a bit more further off than we were anticipating, even though we didn't know it. And hey, you know, a blues-influenced album is perfect. Ambrose has his harmonica, Van has dabbled in boogie before. It turned out fine, right? Well, I certainly can't lie, the songs on this album are all solid. The title track is a brilliant polyrhythmic dual drum part backing this folksy, finger-picked tune about not eating fish, and, th and then it's immediately followed up by this song called Boogeyman Sam, which is a fun song which wouldn't sound too out of place on a T-Rex album like Jeepster or something like that. Uh, the Bird Song is this quaint piano-driven song about human concepts from the perspective of animals. You know, what's a, what's a house to a bird, you know, cars and reality, planes and all that stuff. It's pretty funny. Uh, then you've got a one-two punch of Plastic Boogie and The Crew Millennial. They're both odd metered songs which, excuse me, which are both like lively if straightforward. And they've got this rhythmic drive accompanied by Ambrose playing some of the best harmonica he's ever played on a King Gizzard album. Seriously, the dude fucking blows on this album. It's phenomenal. And uh, to comment a bit more on Plastic Boogie for a moment, it's such a banger of a song about ecological catastrophe. It's, it's got this invigorating refrain, you know, Fuck all of that plastic! So fun. Uh, but Real's Not Real, the next track, it is, it's probably the best track on the album. It alternates with uh, the, the, the next track from Cool Millennial, I should say, not Plastic Boogie. Uh, it alternates between these Beatles-like pop verses and an amazing simple chorded lick from Stu and uh, discordant lick, I should say. Um, the dual drums, they also add some great weight to the song. They double up chaos for when it really gets wild, and Ambrose comes in on the harmonica, and it's got this really cool syncopated bass, like boom, 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 Well, you can't hear it that well because it's syncopated, and I don't really have the metronome playing right now, but you get the idea. Uh, the final few tracks. They uh, incorporate more electric and synth uh, synthetic aspects. We already talked about Cyborg and Acarine, which are, uh, well, Acarine then Cyborg is the final two sequence tracks on the album. But you also have This Thing, which is another track brimming with electronic life, uh, particularly in the synth laden layers from when the song goes from a swing feel to a more straight ahead jam. It's definitely one of the best songs Joey Walker's contributed to the band, in my opinion, and he delivers a killer vocal on it, especially live. He just sort of rips. And although, um, it's fine, with the exception of the, fi the final few tracks, the band isn't exactly reinventing the wheel here. They've done bluesy numbers in the past, they've played Odd Meters straight in the past, the front end of the album is a great set of songs, but they're more a logical continuation of the band's sounds in 2017 instead of the radical reinvention that the final few tracks might suggest. You know, I'll still go back and listen to this album through because it's a fun set of songs, but a few years after the dust has settled, I realize it's more of a mood album for me than one of my more favorite Giz albums. I'm gonna give it a B. Okay. So, the hype train was building for Fishing for Fishy's release, even before it released, mind you. King Gizzard were actually setting their sights even further ahead. Weeks before Fishy's came out, the band dropped a music video for a song called Planet B. Uh, oh cool, you might think. You know, lyric like Planet B goes after the classic phrase, there is no Planet B. You know, they're following up on some of the environmental themes they've been talking about on Banana and Fishies. And then, you click on the video and bam, it's full on thrash metal with a, and the band members are acting like escape mental ward patients and a lady with a shotgun comes and murders them all. Holy shit. Uh... So, I think, uh, back up a bit, I think during 2018, 
The band must have realized the uh, heavier sounds they were teasing on Murder of the Universe and songs like The Great Chain of Being were working well for them and getting their fan base hype as fuck. Because at some point, Stu, Joey, and Cavs got together in some studio and started crafting a full-on uh, metal album. Stu was inspired to pick up the guitar by bands like Exodus, Overkill, and Metallica, so this was actually a bit of a full circle moment for him. Finally, his band were competent enough at what they did, he was competent enough at what he did, to pull off Thrash. And, you know, a bunch of loud recording sessions and overdubs from the other bandmates later, King Gizzard had something truly, sin si blah, something truly sinister on their hands. Infest the rat, rat's nest. Which is this out right here, the one with the rat skeleton at the bottom. Very creepy, very atmospheric cover. Kind of stark, too, compared to what uh, Jason Galea normally does. Uh, up front, I must say that I fucking love the music on this album. I feel a connection with Stu because I was also heavily into thrash metal as a, a young teenage cat and uh, 80s heavy metal in general, uh, when it, especially when I was growing as a musician. And hearing the full-on dropped tuning thrash drifts busted out on songs like Planet B, Venusian 2, Hell, it's so damn infectious, oh my god. Uh, Stu, he... He adopts this more guttural singing voice, which adds considerable weight to the songs, and yet, this is thrash metal that also bears full Gizzard influence. Uh, Stu's guitar feedback once again features a prominent role on the album's soundscapes, and on tracks like Venusian 1 and Self Immolate especially, the band continues swapping between unusual time signatures and breakneck speeds. Uh, Ambrose also has a few harmonica parts in this album, surprisingly, but they act more as haunting cries. I'm thinking in particular of the end of Perihelion, where his harmonica sounds like some sort of hopeless stress signal or mournful siren. Um, I should also mention that not all the album is breakneck thrash. It provides a bit of tonal and rhythmic variety. Rock Mars for the Rich, for instance, is this uh, swingy stomper in the vein of Hole in the Sky by Black Sabbath. Perihelion also swings hard and has this cool car, uh, peri, uh, sorry, it's, uh, perihelion, yes, that's the way to say it, uh, people say perihelion, peri, 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 sauce, chicken, spice, all that stuff, but it swings hard, it's got this cool call and response vocal part in the chorus, and Superbug is basically the sequel to The Great Chain of Being. It's this stoner metal, to a T song, uh, full of chugging riffs, sludgy tempos, an extended soft breakdown with the, where the guitars get to do some noodling. You can tell they were listening to a lot of sleep and maybe smoking a bit of catnip while they were making this song. Uh, but honestly, the music, Though it's great, only plays a small part in the album's weight. But, but this is probably the band's more cohesive lyrical album. It's kind of a loose concept album, and boy is it bleak. The first side deals with current ecological disaster and the fallout from it. Uh, Planet B generally tackles climate change, but then you have Mars for the Rich, decrying Mars colonization as a luxury for those who, know, who can afford space travel. <coughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> Organ Farmer, envisioning a wor world where organ harvesting for the sake of cannibalism is normalized due to lack of food, and Superbug, focusing on a crippling endemic virus which is made worse by reckless use of antibiotics and general lack of inaction. Oh Christ, this one has been made even more horrifying in hindsight. <laughs> Anyways, uh... The second side of the uh, album, uh, side B, if you will, in the traditional sense, uh, documents two future missions to abandon Earth for Venus because how fucked up things have gotten. Uh, the first of which accidentally launches into the sun, which is documented in the tracks Venusian 1 and uh, Perihelion, and the second mission, which actually makes it to Venus, but then goes crazy from confinement to airborne balloons in the atmosphere and decides to commit mass suicide by burning up in the uh, atmosphere of Venus. Uh, this album, uh, sorry, 
that that final set draws from Venetian 2, self Emily and Hell, in case you were wondering. Uh, but this album, it draws very, very well from the metal tradition of lyrics which realize that the most terrifying thing to sing about isn't the devil or fantasy stories about wizards, but the follies of man. Those sorts of metal lyrics have a very, very rich lineage, going all the way back to, like, War Pigs and Hand of Doom by Black Sabbath, and finding a comfortable home in the gritty lyrics of the San Francisco Bay Thrash scene in the 1980s. Uh, whether it was Metallica or Megadeth decrying the Cold War political climate, a needless war, or Slayer taking the lens to the fucked up atrocities of Nazi physician Joseph Mengele, uh, a lot of these albums were pretty outspoken about human-led mass death catastrophe. And so, you know, maybe I don't listen to that much metal these days, but I've never seen a metal band tackle climate change like that, you know, in the way that King Gizzard does on this entire album. Every song is meant to highlight the direction we're headed if we don't get our act together. Uh, drawing from both things which are happening before our very eyes right now, uh, and speculation from scientists to present us, the listener, with a bleak version of things to come. A man-made catastrophe so awfully consequential that it, it drives what's left of humanity to suicide and subsequently hell, or the titular rat's nest. Uh, the song's lyrics were chilling then, and they're especially so now, especially super fun, Jesus Christ. And they, and they go perfectly with the heavy metal sound of the entire album. Overall, S. S, 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 S. Uh, it's probably up there for me. Sorry, get some water. probably right up there for me with Murder of the Universe as it's one of my favorite Giz albums just because of how tight and cohesive it is. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this album is just under 35 minutes, but it does not waste a single second of that time. It's like, it's kind of like uh, Paper Mache and, Paper Mache and uh, almost 12 Bar Bruce in a way, except, I don't know. This, this is a thrash metal reinvention that ties in so well to the band's older sound, and it's absolutely sold by the bleak, dystopian, if no less possible, lyrics sung by Gravel Throat Stew. If you like any sort of metal, odds are you are going to come away from this album satisfied, so give it a listen. I will admit, though, uh, I do think that... I do think my personal bias plays a bit of a role in me loving this album as much as I do, because I remember riding the hype train for this album back in the day, you know, because I loved heavier Gizzard material, so hearing that they were making this full-on thrash metal album, and hearing, you know, as the band toured live and we got more bootlegs of these new songs live, oh my god, dude, this entire concert, what they, they did in, like, they played in Seoul, I think, South Korea, and they played the entire album back to front like months before it came out. And this entire concert, I think, is still up on YouTube. It's so, it's so great. Um, but I was one of those fans who was just like, I was on the edge of my seat waiting for this album. And the, my expectations were not only met, they were exceeded. I went to go see these guys when they toured for this album and Fishing for Fishies. Um, when they came by New York City and, uh, uh, specifically Central Park, I got to see them there live and, oh my god, they killed the Rat's Nest songs live. They felt like such a natural extension of Gizzard's usual rowdy music, so it was just a bit more headbanging, and so it's, I don't know, I, I really do love the, this album, and I feel like it is... I mean, it's not only a reinvention of the band, but it's it's a logical progression from where they were before. It's just such a great album. Um, but, anyways, with 15 albums now under their belts, oh god, Jesus Christ, I have talked about 15 albums so far. Um, the band had a bunch of they had, they had a bunch of possibilities laid out before them. Uh, they began planning for a huge U.S. tour in 2020, uh, with a few shows lined up where they be, 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 uh, they would be playing songs from their entire discography. Um, 
They even played a few, I, I think they played a few shows in Australia of that year, uh, in February of that year, largely to raise funds for wildfire relief. You know, rem remember the Australian bushfires of 2020 and how the news was focusing on that for that entire month? Sadly, as we all know now, the Australian brush fires of that year wouldn't be the worst disaster, the worst disaster to strike. Uh, when the world started shuddering because of sea vid, uh, the band were in a weird spot, but not an unsalvageable, not an unsalvageable one. Uh, they have a bunch of live soundboard recordings from the last tour that they could just drop on Bandcamp if they wanted as well as a live concert film, Chunky Stratnell, on the way. They'd made albums in home studios before also, in probably conditions that would be similar to self-isolation, uh, and they could make them again. The only problem is... <sighs> Eric left the band at this time. Yes, for uh, whatever reason, Eric Moore decided to part ways with the band by the summer. The given and most likely explanation is that he left to focus on running Flightless because, at this point, yeah, there were a bunch of other cool acts on that label that were worthy of promotion and attention and love, too, and we'll probably talk about some of them sometime in the future. There are rumors out there that there was some bad blood between Eric and the band, especially since the band has been putting out all their new albums independently since his departure, but... I don't want to give anything unconfirmed credence, so let's just go with the Occam's Razor, what? The Occam's Razor explanation of an amicable split between the band and Eric's growing business enterprise. But with, uh, but with Eric out of the band, the band had lost a crucial element of their sound: the dual drums. Uh, they probably, they probably can never do Crumbling Castle justice live again let alone for create fascinating new rhythmic textures with that, with that sort of sound. So, where did the band decide to go next? Well, you see, I, I forgot to mention something about Flying Microtonal Banana. It actually has a subtitle, Explorations into Microtonal Tuning, Volume 1. To the band, it was always a matter of when, not if, the next volume would drop, and they were, in fact, showing signs of put pursuing this route further on their 2019 tours, with the stop in Istanbul, where they would purchase some new microtonal instruments. But yes, with the globe in lockdown and the need to continue on without Eric, the band decided to smash the, gl the glass and, pr uh, and press the big red button, which says microtones. And lo and behold, there were microtones. The first resulting effort, and yes, I said first, we'll come back to that, was KG, the band's only studio release for 2020, which came out that November. Hot take incoming, this album fucking rules and it is a definite improvement over Flying Microtonal Banana. It's like The Empire Strikes Back to fly, Flying Microtonal Banana's Star Wars, or I guess A New Hope if you want to be pandemic like that. Uh, the first major improvement over a flying microtonal banana is KG's pacing. The longest track on the album, the frail acoustic track Straws in the Wind, is under six minutes long, and it comes four tracks into the album after being led into by a rustic instrumental intro, uh, which is a title track, by the way, and two banging microtonal rock tunes. Each track leads into one another, some of the segs so naturally written with the songs themselves that this album feels almost like the microtonal equivalent of Nonagon Infinity. In any case, the, the flow from song to song in the first five tracks make them one of the strongest sets from the band since Nonagon Infinity. While the B-side, though, while the B-side, I mean, it's more varied in t it, it is more varied in tempo and tone from song to song. It still retains decent continuity in its sings. Another major improvement is that, in addition to the Anatolian rock influences the band displayed on the last album, and they're still here, don't get me wrong, Automation is a great track in that sort of sense. Um, they've embraced more worldly sounds on KG to present perhaps their most worldly music to date. Uh, Cavs, who now has to fill all the drumming duties uh, for the first time since uh, uh, Eyes Like the Sky, at least, um, does more than pick up the slack. He delivers these killer drum parts on songs like Minimum Brain Size, Some of Us, which wouldn't sound that out of place on a Fera Kuti album. 
Intrasport is this out of left field song which sounds like a cross between Girls and Boys by Blur and in an Arabian pop song. Uh, Odd Life is a tour de, for de force describing the realities of touring life with another killer drum line from Cavs and an incredible descending guitar frame. Actually, several great guitar riffs. Very, very funky, and a vocal section from Ambrose, which versions, which versions almost unwrapping a little bit. <laughs> Not quite, I mean, these are not going to be doing like Dr. Dre or N.W.A. or anything like that soon, or any of the new rappers that I'm not familiar, that familiar with because I don't listen to much hip-hop. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's great. Um, even the more traditional, I mean, I use traditional with air quotes the, there, uh, even the more traditional songs on this album, you know, Straws in the Wind, Ontology, Honey, uh, The Hungry Wolf of Fate, they're simply helped along by the band having a sure grip on their microtonal songwriting sensibilities. Straws in the Wind is a great acoustic-driven song. Like I said, it sounds very frail, uh, almost tinny. Uh, and it's for good reason, because I think the, the, some of the guitars were recorded on uh, iPhones again, um, you know, to give that sort of quality. Um, it's helped, um, you know, it's a great acoustic-driven song where Ambrose, he delivers his best Scott Walker impression, and I, I'm sure very few people are going to get that reference, but I made that anyways. Um, Ontology, it's a really fun song with a groovy Egyptian sounding verse and a killer harmonica refrain. Honey is this acoustic song all a paper mache dream balloon, only with more microtones and the, the drum and bass absolutely make it. Uh, the Hungry Wolf of Fate is the closer of the album and it comes hot the heels, hot up the heels of the peaceful Honey to slam the listeners with a creepy doom metal song right before the end. Ah, oh, classic gizzard, right? It's an absolutely killer track that puts a microtonal spin on the classic Devil's Third riff we see in metal songs like Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath, or even classical music by, uh, like Gustav Holst, like The Planets. Uh, the build-up section in the middle leading to the heavy climax is the perfect way to cap off this album, in, in my opinion. Uh, maybe it was just me starved for new Gizzard content and sort of stagnating and listening to new music during my self-isolation, but I really came to love this album after it came out, and I listened to it a lot. It really felt to me like Giz had taken what made Flying Microtonal Banana work and refined it both to create not just incredible microtonal songs, which could be appreciated on their own, but a ride of an album experience as well. Um, as I said, this is Gizzard coming into their own with microtonality, as they had come into their own regular rock sound before in, my, in Mind Fuzz and Nanagon. If you're going to give any microtonal Gizzard a, a try, uh, I would recommend you start here. I give this album an S. Uh, set... Big ol' KG right there on the front. And it's got a bit more detail too, obviously, if you look at the cover. But, yeah, what is next? I mean, it might be a bit obvious, but it quickly, at least to the fan base, became apparent for a few reasons that KG was not a one-off thing. For one, uh, the title, as you might guess, was clearly based off of the band's initials, KG and LW. Uh, fans, then, were waiting on an LW shoe to drop even before KG had come out. But suspicions were heightened even further when it was clear that the Hungry Wolf of Fate ended abruptly and then promptly confirmed by the band a few weeks later when they released another song which continued directly after it called If Not Now Then When. Uh, the Giz Pump was once again primed and we had more microtones due on the way for 2021. So, LW came out this past February, and as everyone expected, it was basically the second half of KG. It was uh, the Amnesiac to uh, KG's Kid A, the 2020 Experience Part 2 to KG's 2020 Experience, and, well, um, how to say, much like those preceding examples, uh, LW's lacking in its, uh, lacking in comparison to its predecessor in a lot of ways. For one, 
The transitions are not nearly as clean as they are on KG. There are some neat transitions, like the sped up groove at the end of one, into the opening hi-hat uh, hi -hat hits of Flora, uh, the continuation of the rustic acoustic atmosphere between static electricity and uh, east-west wing. But others are, uh, others are less clean, if not outright non-existent. If not now, then when just sort of stops into one, and same with Flora into Supreme Ascendancy. Ataraxia just sort of takes a big dump on the album's continuity, neither segging into another track or being segged into by the previous. Also, some of the songs just aren't as strong as what came before. Uh, if Not Now Then When is a fine minimal funk song a la an immortal orchestra about the impending apocalypse. Uh, apocalypse. The impending apocalypse. The impending apocalypse. But I still don't know how I feel about it being the opener, especially with the whole uh, freeform band intro it gets. Uh, I mean, just imagine how that would sound. You know, it's just sort of... And, you know, it starts like that, and then it goes right into one, which is in the same key, and it's... Ah, I mean, of course, I'm not King Gizzard. Uh, King Gizzard are the ones who should decide how their music goes, but... I don't know, I feel like that was untapped potential there. Um, but Ataraxia, then, uh, that's another song. It just, it goes on a bit too long for my taste. So it's got an extended percussion breakdown at the end. But it does, it's softer, more psychedelic take on something Tool might write is pretty interesting. And then See Me is just a weaker version of Odd Life with a gamelan sounding synth noise in place of the latter's amazing microtonal guitar licks. So, I don't know, not a lot to say there. All that said, there's, there's still a lot to like about this album. Um, the tracks one, uh, that is uh, acronymed O-N-E, and Plura, for example, are classic Gizzard microtonal garage psych. The latter seems to draw an influence from Polygon's Wonderland and its polymetric instrumental parts and, and simply fluty textures. Uh, synth, uh, Supreme Ascendancy is a scathing attack on the Catholic Church and its cover-up of molestation at the hands of priests with a fantastic driving groove. Uh, static Electricity and East West Link, as I've mentioned before, they're rustic pieces with acoustic and electric microtonal guitar, which have incredible drive and vocal melodies and well, Static Electricity does at least. Uh, East West Link is a bit less memorable, but it's still a nice rock jam with classic stew woos! Uh, the highlight of this album, though, is its closer, PGLW. Not to be confused with the introductory track of the same name on the past album, this is a fully fledged doom metal owl anthem, which brings back the former track's melody to chant the band's initials. Now, some of you may be looking at this weird band and thinking that, uh, that they might be a cult and, uh, well, this song is not exactly helping the case, but it fucking rocks. Uh, the song drives uh, the, into two, uh, the, the song dives into two extended metal breakdowns in the course of its runtime between the chanting and you can tell the band were brushing up on their Sabbath. And maybe even their television, I don't know, you might hear a bit of, like, Marky Moon in the sort of way that the song just progresses. Uh, for, because it has a great sense of flow in spite of its runtime and jamming nature. It may be over eight minutes, but it feels like four and it leaves you wanting more. Overall, I would give this album, um, LW here, I would give it a B. Um... It has some, you know, it, it's got some amazing highlights, and it ends the duology between it and KG with a bang, but it does go through a few bumps and snags on the way. If the preceding Empire is the Empire Strikes Back of the King Gizzard Microtonal Trilogy, then this is almost certainly the Return of the Jedi. Not necessarily a bad album, but one whose flaws become all the more apparent when compared with its predecessor. And let me take what should be the final water sip of this stream, because we have made it, folks. We are almost to the end. We've got one more album to cover. Can you believe it? Jeez. We talked about 18 albums this stream, and we are, what is it, two hours in? Let me check. Yeah, two hours. Jesus.
But anyways, let's continue onward, shall we? We shall. Um, so, after LW came out, right, uh, this is a bit recent in the timeline, I know, but bear with me here. After LW came out, it was, uh, it was February, and King Gizzard began playing live shows again, and they were promoting a new microtonal duology, uh, since, you know, Australia, they've had, uh, you know, I, I don't want to make this, uh, too political an environment or discussion. They've had more, but they have had, a. Uh, considerably easier time on, and they've had their shit considerably more together in dealing with the uh, you know what than most other places. We've gotten a few we've gotten a few cool live videos on YouTube out of you know these promotional gigs. You know, Sydney live in Sydney in 21, live in Melbourne 21. They're both incredible live gigs. Um, and they absolutely rock these new microtonal tracks alongside the other microtonal stuff from Fine Microtonal Banana, Gumboot Soup, and even sketches from uh, Brunswick East. They bring back like D Day and I think the book? I don't know. Um, but knowing that constant touring around the globe like they were doing before, uh, you know what struck, knowing that that was still, you know, a long ways away, at least like a year, like. They've, uh, they've scheduled a bunch of U.S. tour dates for next year already, in the fall. That's, uh, that, that gives you an idea of uh, the sort of time scale they're looking at. Um, but yeah, because they knew they were sort of not going to tour around the world anytime soon, they figured, you know, the collective mind was always set on another album. This time they would sort of plunge headfirst into synths. And we got a bunch of hints like that leading, leading up to the album's announcement. But anyways, uh, the band announced uh, Butterfly 3000, the final album here, which has got this, uh, hold on a second. It's just got this gorgeous psychedelic album cover here, courtesy of Jason Galea. Um, and uh, it was announced that with the caveat that there would also be no singles. Stu was going on record as saying as it was his favorite King Gizzard album. So needless to say, there was a lot of hype building up for this record. I mean, as is the case probably for a lot of other King Gizzard uh, records. The King Gizzard fan base is easily excited when the band tries exploring new musical directions. Uh, but, did this hype deliver? That is the big question. Well, keep in mind, it's only been like a few weeks since the album came out. Uh, it, it dropped on June 11th, so it's kind of difficult to say since we're not sure how this fits into the future of Giz or like their live shows beyond the promotional uh, cycle. Uh, you know, they're, they're currently in the middle of releasing a video for like every song on the album, which Good luck with that. You kind of dropped the ball with Nonagon Infinity, but we'll see. Uh, this might age poorly. Um, what else? Um, but yeah, we haven't even uh, seen King Gizzard go out and tour live for these songs yet. They haven't played them live in any capacity. So it's difficult to really, really get a sense for where they are in the broader King Crimson discography. King Crimson. King Gizzard discography. But, what I will say is that on this album, the band produces fascinating soundscapes with a creative melding of modular synths, acoustic instruments, and keyboards that work better on some songs than others. To speak of the good first, and there is a lot of good to talk about here, uh, the, run, the, fir the run of the first four tracks is incredible. Uh, yours is a lively sequencer-driven pop song with echoes of, echoes of the faster-paced garage material in the rhythm section, which then leads into Shanghai, which is even more immaculate. Oh my gosh. Uh, seriously, if you like good psychedelic pop along the lines of Tim and Paula, Shanghai is a goddamn dream. Incorporating something more of an East Asian melody in its synth and guitar lines as Ambrose delivers his best Barry Gibb impression over an unimpeachable backbeat reminiscent of I'm Sleeping In. Then there are Dreams and Blue Morpho, which are two sides of the same coin. Uh, Dreams is a transcendent arcade synth melody in our odd meter over a straightforward drum pattern, 
and then Blue Morpho takes over with a darker ascending progression, which reminds me, uh, with a rarely, rarely, very complicated, uh, sorry, not rarely, but a very complicated, like, metric meter. It, it, it reminds me a lot of, like, Radiohead's Pyramid song, all, almost, like, in its metric complexity, and Stu's falsetto vocals. Reminds me, yeah, reminds me a bit of, like, a, yeah, like, Amnesiac Era Radiohead. But then we got Catch and Smoke, which is another fantastic track. It sounds like it could have been, it could have been something that Tim and Paula put on Currents, except with maybe a few more time signature shifts. It's one of the only tracks that's got a prominent electric guitar part on the album, and mixed with the reverberant synth textures and the cab steady and the pocket drumming, the effect is really something fantastic. Yo, uh, if this song isn't on your Summer 2K21 playlist yet, fucking add it. It's the perfect jam to listen to when you reunite with friends for the first time in ages. It's just such a happy, upbeat tune. Lastly, the, the final two tracks on the album, Ya Love and Butterfly 3000. It's a fantastic closing sequence. Uh, the former sounds like something of a cross between Fragile Era Yes and MGMT, showering the listener in a clean acoustic guitars, flute, flute synthesizers, and falsetto, courtesy, courtesy of Sue. Uh, the track leads right into Butterfly 3000, which is the title track, obviously, which is a gradual build from solo synths and piano to a propulsive jam with a band, full band to a closing psychedelic freakout to end the album on something distinctly gizzardy. Other tracks, though, uh, they run on a bit too long for my tastes. Um, Interior People, for instance, has a great start, but it sort of loses the thread for me after like the three and a half, four minute mark. Uh, Black Hot Soup is similar, starting off pretty cool and folky and whatnot, but quickly devolving into another percussion jam that's, <laughs> I think, straight out of Ataraxia. It almost sounds that way, almost. Then 2.02 Killer Year puts some cool staccato sounding synths at the forefront, and it's fine, but the meter kind of, for me, makes it hard to follow at times. Uh, I haven't really revisited that much uh, since uh, my first listen. Um, I, it's come up on Spotify playlist, and I will listen to it, but I don't know, I'm, I don't make it a point to listen to that track. So, in the end, where does that leave us? I think that all around, uh, the new album is good. Many of the songs are just King Gizzard songs with synths in place of the guitars and shooting feedback and all that. So it's not like the band had to radically reinvent how they approached their music to make a de decent synth-based album, but at the same time, it probably could have been a bit more. Uh, shouldn't there have been at least one EDM moment, like on Acarine? That would have been pretty dope if they returned to that sort of thing. Also, as I've mentioned, there are a few songs on here that are either a bit undercooked or, in the case of 2.02 Killer Year, uh, maybe a bit overcooked. I'm going to give this album a B for right now. Who knows, uh, maybe... Maybe, in, maybe later listens will give me more of an appreciation for it, but to me, right now, it's just another good King Gizzard release. And, you know, perhaps I'm biased, but as this tier list will show, that is nothing special in and of itself. <laughs> okay, and with that, I think we are done with our tier list stream for today. This has been a... this has been quite a journey. Uh, we are at... where are we at right now? Currently... Currently we've reached, um... We got two concurrent viewers. Uh, we've reached uh, two minutes and 15 seconds on this whole uh, 18 album odyssey. And thank you for everybody who joined me, uh, whether or not you stopped in for the entire stream or are still here for most of the runtime. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, uh, I'm going to be uh, after the stream ends. I'm going to be going in. I'm going to be going in the description. So. If you came in and you missed any uh, of the album rankings here, any of the explanations for why certain albums are the way they are, uh, I will be putting in timestamps for uh, when I talk about each album. So look forward to that on the archive. Um, regarding, the, regarding my future content, uh, I have a stream on Friday planned. Um, I'm going to be playing some more bullets per minute. I'm looking forward to that because... Uh, 
I haven't touched, uh, I've, been, I've purposely been avoiding that, uh, I've purposely been avoiding that, um, that game until I can play it again on stream. Much to, uh, much to my sort of chagrin. But, don't worry, my addiction will be sated soon, we'll be back to playing more of that fun game. Hopefully, um, I don't know, last time there was a bit, a bit of latency between what I was hearing in the monitor and what I was speaking into the microphone, so... Maybe I can get that fixed. If not, I'll probably try and rely less on this monitor. Um... But yeah. Um, I will see you all on Friday at 6 p.m. Same time as this stream, actually. Um, for some bullets per minute. And, uh, if you loved this music review, or if you liked it, if you liked sh hanging out, chilling, listening to me talk about my musical opinions, uh, do consider subscribing to this channel, you know, giving a like to the video, um, ringing, ringing the notification bell for, uh, uh, notifications, you know, all of that stuff helps me grow my channel, so please, if, if you haven't taken the time to do that and you like what you see, do that. Um, is there anything else that I need to say for today? I'm trying to pick my brain right now. Um, take care, Black, ne Black Redneck. Thank you so much for stopping in. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, no, I guess, I guess that's really it. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm gonna see you guys. I'm gonna see you guys some more on Friday for some bullets per minute at 6 p.m. that day. So I will see y'all next time. Bye bye.